Happy Friday, the weekend of Mother's Day. So let me just start off by saying, whether you're a fur baby mama or a mama mama, or you've got a mama, happy Mama's Day to everyone out there. Um, gosh, I can't believe it's the first week in May. So happy Cinco de Mayo, that happened the other day too. Um, this is Between the Sheets, we're on the first and third Friday of every month here on United Broadcasting Network. Follow me on Instagram, QTE Brat, and always Between the Sheets Facebook on Facebook page. We have an amazing guest today, she's fucking funny. I mean, she's not just funny, I mean, she's fucking funny. And then adding her with Jenny McNulty, I have no idea the hijinks and the chaos that will happen on the show, but that's what makes us between the sheets. Um, don't forget, we do live call-ins, 323-524-2599. That's 323-524-2599. I'm gonna go around the room, let you know who the ladies are here today, and then we'll just bring on, I mean, Suzanne's here. It's not like it's a big reveal, like we're in the studio. Everyone sees her. So we'll just get to her last, pretty much. So I'm gonna start with Roxanne Rosen. Roxanne, stop looking at the fucking phone. Pay attention, ADC. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. This has been an absolutely wonderful week with many, many, many good things to be excited about. <laughs> It was so nice to see you and Mara, who's not here today, another regular. We actually went out to lunch at Pink Tacos. Um, the food was so, eh, it's okay. Um, but it was all in all a pleasure seeing you guys in person and giving you a big, like, after COVID hug. Well, it's not after COVID, but you know what I mean. Uh, whatever. COVID vaccinated thingy huggy. So yeah. there we go. Um, then we have, she hasn't been around in a long time. She's been, she's putting her hand up in front of the camera. Um <laughs> <laughs> are you giving us your fingerprint? Are you that addicted to the computer that now everything is a fingerprint um, to, to, to verify it's you, Jenny McNulty? What have you been up to, my dear friend? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, I was in rehab. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I should be, but I wasn't. Uh, anyway, I have just been uh, doing my shows and uh, I'm going to be live in Ventura next Thursday. I'm super excited about that. But I've just been, just been kind of working and having fun. Also, are you going to do the big room or the smaller room in Ventura? Uh, it's noon. And when they opened it back up again, they're just going to be having the big room now. So we're nice. about that. I know it's it's limited capacity. It's It holds 170. They're only allowed to put 80 in there. So um, get your tickets quickly because they will uh, fill up. And who's going to be performing that night? Um, it's a really amazing comedian named Suzanne Westenhofer. Shocking! <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> wow, it's the Suzanne Westenhofer week, week, month. It should be like it is. It is. And then we should just add another month after December, Weston Ember. You know what I mean? We just like throw <laughs> that in there. Um, Cheryl Murphy, what have you been doing? What Guys, type of readings and media? Yep. I've been doing healings and readings and going live on Facebook and Clubhouse is a new phone app. So I'm doing Clubhouse now. If you guys haven't heard of that, another great place to find good people like you guys. And so, yeah, just doing a lot of events uh, with the spring and the summer. We're all starting to get out there. So we're going you know, to take it a little bit at a time, but we're getting there. Awesome. I never heard of Clubhouse. And I did a, my shoot today with Julie Chen, the, who's the host of Big Brother. We did her big photo shoot today. And um, the social media people were there and they were like, we have to do this thing called Clubhouse. And I, I got a rundown of what Clubhouse is. Okay. So Big Brother actually um, is going to be the first show, the real show to be platforming on Clubhouse. So we're kind of excited yeah. about that. Yeah. So there. Um, well, do I really need to talk about Suzanne Westenhofer besides the fact that I keep tripping over her name, her last name? Is it? Um, I can't even spell it right, so I try not to. I just cut and paste. Um, <laughs> it's just better to just cut and paste when you've got a name like that. But um, so I'll, I have her little bio here. As you all know, um, I just read it really quick. 25 years, even though she's only what what are you 28 29 25 years out of the womb she came out funny groundbreaking stereotype shattering and brutally honest comedy she's pulling the punches now you always do you were from oh i, I didn't read this 
you were a kid from the Amish. Is it Amish or Amish? Amish. Amish. Seriously? Yeah. Like you wore those little outfits and, and did cherry water and shit? I mean, really? No, no, I'm not. I wasn't Amish. I'm from Amish County, Amish country, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Because I. You're a Jersey girl. You heard of it. I did. I've been there. And I was thinking, because for a second, that vision crossed my mind of you churning butter. And I'm thinking, no wonder she's a comedian. Who the hell would do? I mean, seriously, like if you were like, whatever. Now you were the first openly lesbian comedian, the comedian on the late night with David Letterman on my own, oh, my network, CBS. Um, Sally Jesse Raphael, you've been everywhere. And you're, you're know, like, you've earned, you've earned your chops. And you are like, sort of like, I don't know, like an icon in the comedic world. Um, I've heard you many times. I've seen you perform a few times with the Andrea Meyerson thing, um, Andrea's Meyerson events and stuff. But, you know, I've also seen you on TV. And, and um, so, you know, we'll just, I mean, most people know you, but for people that don't and bring it up to date. So like, how did you start in comedy why did you why did you move this way how did it happen what was your first big break i wanted to be uh i thought ever since i was a small child i was going to be a famous movie star i actually wrote in a diary that i i'm like oh my god 13 years old and i wrote i was going to be a famous mo movie star and live in new york city so i didn't have that right and, <laughs> um and then i would take a series of young male lovers you didn't get that right either. Um, well, <laughs> epic fail. <laughs> <laughs> but did you ever do the straight thing or never? Not, uh, you mean like I had sex with boys and dated boys and all that until I had sex with a girl when I was 19. Then there's no coming back. Right. Um, oh, you don't have to fake the orgasm. This rocks. <laughs> um, then, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that was a, that's the lesbian thing of it. And um, I started stand-up. Oh, this is the worst part of it, Gayan, is I started 30 years ago. Really? I'm a thousand. It's okay. I'm at my job at CBS. I started there in 1989. <gasps> yeah. So, I mean, it was... Um, so, you know, we're the same age, which is fine, because you know what? We yes. are... Yeah, I mean, you know what? Like these millennial people, here we go. I, I you know me, yeah. and my millennials, here my millennials. I don't do, I don't do hatred of millennials. I just think that they're a bunch of misguided, misdirected, arrogant chip on their shoulder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they know everything, coddled, baby coddled um, generation. <laughs> Here's the thing, you know, because I have gone back and forth with with millennials being extremely sensitive when I speak. However, um, really trying hard to open up my mind last last year, I really realized that I don't think they're being sensitive. I think what it is about them is that they're learning at a young age how someone should already be treating them and, <sighs> and boundaries and um, what they are going to tolerate and walking away and not taking life so seriously and enjoying themselves. Because when I did stop to talk to a lot of them, they're actually smart and, and in their own way. And the way that they view the world is just shaped so much differently. So I blame so much the Gen X and, you know, uh, for ruining the millennials, but on the flip, on the other side, um, I really feel like they are just, I'm not gonna tolerate this and I'm walking away. I think um, I wanna they say also have like, oh. we've ruined the planet for them. I mean, their, yeah. their future is yeah. precariously balanced on whether or not we can turn a bunch of greedy SOBs minds around and for no reason other than for the planet, they're gonna give up money and change the way they do things. And I think like every generation thinks the previous generation was all messed up and the subsequent ones are all messed up. It's just that now all of a sudden we've sort of chopped it up into many of them. Like 
back, you know, once the baby boomers were like the first named generation, I think. Right. I mean, that would be me. That would be me, the tail end of that one, which I'm still pissed off at my mother that she just couldn't wait another eight days and I would have been in the next one. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but I mean, they didn't have a whole bunch of segmented groups of people to judge. And and if anything, it's just, we're so freaking judgy from Facebook, you know, not just Facebook, yeah. so MySpace. Well, who creates, I mean, seriously, who creates this terminology? Gen Xers, baby boomers. Yeah millennials i mean who, who who actually puts that moniker on generations media yeah, it is good i'll go i'll go 10 points you got that but it, it is because you know i mean when we think about it you know there's just so much let's face it discrimination we just came out of a couple of years of heavy major mm -hmm. discrimination against you know you know whether it's gender whether it's skin color whether it's language it's just you know, this country, unfortunately, with that dickwad that was president, I mean, he brought it to the surface and he made it okay to right. be an asshole. Mm -hmm. um, and and people were just, you know, it was really scary because he brought out the worst in, in people. And I wonder if those people were just good people and they were influenced because, you know, it was that that's who they are. Or were they never good people? And that's really scary if they were never good people. Yeah. Gay, and do you think it was that, uh, and I really do, it's always existed. And uh, what he did was there was a permission allowed for the people to be, to say this behavior that they felt. And they all, and because of um, the internet, they can see each other and be all like, yeah, we're all like this because before they were off in the closet somewhere so they could only maybe gather eight of them or 10 of them. And he gave this permission and it just opened up this sort of, uh, hey, we're all like this. See, I have five people on Facebook who say the same thing, yeah. you know, and they're, and, and it, then the algorithms fed that opinion. And you're looking at the fact that these people that felt that way for 30 years had to be politically correct. And they yeah. were allowed to be that. So you're taking this behavior that was already there, all those comments that they wanted to say so bad that right. they had to hold in, they were a boof, out it came. Yeah. And and like Suzanne said, they all felt like they had community because their algorithms showed them like-minded people. Yep. Yeah, and all these buzzwords, you know, all these buzzwords and buzz phrases, it just gave everybody something to hang on to and yeah. be a part of and yeah, uh, be that group mentality. What do you see, Cheryl, like, you know, I mean, you're um, a psychic medium, right? So you yes. see, you can see things from different perspectives. Do you, anything sort of out there that you have seen changing? Is it a cyclical thing that we've all gone through that just played this way now and it was a different way back in the 400s or whatever? <laughs> well, here's the deal is just a lot of things are crashing right now. You know, a lot of paradigms are crashing and shifting and we're all moving into that higher awareness and awakening. And a lot of it isn't pretty, you know, and a lot of it's hard and a struggle or it's a, it's a fall down, it's a breakdown and it's hopefully it's a breakthrough for, for a lot of people, but you know, it's going to take, it's going to take that clashing, so to speak, you know, in order to create something wonderful and beautiful. So yeah, it's, it's all got to come out. We've all got to, you know, air our laundry or filter it or get it out. You know, let's talk about it. And hopefully that's what's, what's happening. Hopefully in all of this, that chaos, hopefully there is some good, meaningful, valuable, you know, communication resources coming out of it. Well, Can I, I feel that that's really, I'm sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah. first man for Roxanne. Um, if I, I want to come back and look just like you. You are so incredibly beautiful, which is shallow. And if I can't come back and look like you, I'm not coming back. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, but I think that we also, um, I've been listen, listening to show, I, I have cassette tapes of shows that I did in 94, 95. You know, we were all supposed to tape them, everything like that. I was listening to them recently. And here's the truth. Because uh, I can tell because I was always saying what was going on in the news and stuff like that or how they were dealing with queers and stuff. We got better. What? Oh, no. We really did. Which means, I know, oh, which means I, I think we go through it. It gets bared. And but we we do keep moving on. In, and I can only say that for our United States society because every society is going to be different. 
but we're better already than 25 years ago in a very big way. Like it's, I, I say something, I hear myself say something and I'll go, oh my God, what? Was that, did we think that way? And it's 20 years ago or 18 years ago and you go, that's not that long. Oh, it's not. It isn't. I mean, no. I came out here in 1985 and you know, I, I didn't know what I was. I didn't know if I was gay. I didn't know what I was. I, just, I used to, I think I just said I was bi because I didn't know what I was and I'd never been with a man, gold star here. Um, so, but I thought, well, I have to be with a guy, but I really like the girl. And you're right. Once you, once you meet a girl and you go through that and it's like that, and I had sex with a woman for being, it was like, oh, it was so clear, so yeah. clear. And I mean, I remember like one of the first events I went to was gay pride in West Hollywood. Oh. And, and I remember they used to have the gates and it was all covered with like plastic. So nobody can look in. Mm. No, one, it was like our private space where you could hold your girlfriend's hand. And it was like that safe space. And then, you know, eventually in 1999, I became, I was part of, I became part of the board and did that for 12 years. And even though we made, you know, in the big picture, it doesn't look like we've made such huge strides in our community, but we have, we yeah. really have. And, um, and it's never fast enough. You know, I, I tell younger people when they talk about when we talk about like, you know, you know, it's so wonderful. Like you can walk down the street. Now you may still get, unfortunately, crazy people that will screw with you and beat you. That, that unfortunately hasn't stopped, but there is an openness to be able to feel more comfortable doing it. Whereas I'm before, hell no. You know, now, you know, I remember like my partner. Literally. Yeah. They, even in places that we think of as being gay friendly and have been gay friendly and all that stuff that's changed dramatically in the past 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, each time you go back, it's gotten better. You, the key thing you said is about time because when you're 20 and you go, oh, I'm gay or whatever it is you wanna call yourself and then and you want everybody to accept it because you did and damn it and let's jump on. But you don't look back and go, wait, I didn't know when I was five or I didn't even understand sexuality. It took me some time to get here. It's gonna, it, so like right now, um, whatever is the hot thing that, and they're going, you need to respect gender, right? Okay, that's true. And some of them who are younger, will they want it now. Right now you have to get with the pronouns. Right now you have to get with all this stuff. This will all happen. I, I'm now so old, I, can, I feel like I can say that. <laughs> but it's, it isn't going to happen in the time period you like because you're 22 and you're right in the hot minute of it. Yeah. And then when they look back, when they're 50, so, you're right, they're going to go, oh, my God, I really, we did change. That's the hard part. Patience. We have to have patience to understand that people have to hear it, learn it, go through whatever they have to go through. And then it just gets to think about who, who, who anywhere has heard anything, anybody say anything negative about like a black person being with a white person. A long time, I haven't. Yeah, long time. Long time. Yeah, biracial. All through the sixties and seventies, like if I talk to my older sisters or my mother, my God, that was the, and it was the worst thing you could do. Like you could be shot on the street. Now we're like, really? They <laughs> care about that? They care about that? Yeah. And then there was always like, like, like the the terminology of what they used to, you know. Oh my God, it was horrible. And I remember, I remember in college. Now my parents were not prejudiced. They were an absolutely not. And um. And I remember there was a guy in college named Lawrence and he was a person of color and he took a shine to me. But of course I, I didn't really go forward with it because I wasn't sure what to do. I, I just was like, no. Um, and then, cause of course I was born Catholic. So it's like, oh my God, the first time I have sex, I'm gonna get pregnant. I mean, I, like, literally it was like that whole crappy shit. So I was like, maybe we kissy faced a little bit. But I remember, like thinking, and, and I don't know why, because my parents were fine with it. Their, their best friends were, you know, a, a, people of color. My, my parents, but I always thought, oh my God, like if I, what if I brought him home as my boyfriend? And, you know, it wasn't them. It wasn't even me. It was the perception of what others would think. Right. Yep. 
But now who cares? I mean, not really. Who cares? You have to want change. You have to work for change. But you're obviously going to do that most likely when you're like trying to find light when you're like 20. And the truth is, you, at 20, you're not patient enough to understand that just because you now accept this and you want this, that immediately everyone's going to jump on that. And I think the number one thing is you got to want it, you got to work for it, but then you got to be patient to let people kind of grow into it mm -hmm. and, and understand it. I'm in somebody else's house. Can you tell? Yeah, it's like a Spike Lee movie. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> and I That's think you the... have to like, you like be patient, but have to continually say mm -hmm. yes you know, and continually cor correct, not correct people, but go, this is the appropriate way. This is how it has to be until eventually it, it becomes the norm. You know, I had Suzanne on my show today and I found this old clip of her when she was on Sally Jesse Raphael in 1991. Mm. <laughs> it's actually in the middle of it where there was another, les it was all about lesbians, um, who you know looked feminine and just the thing and one of the gals was talking about the word or they were talking about the word i think it was dyke probably or, or it might have even been the word lesbian and she was saying and she was sitting right next to a woman of color and she just like casually went you know it's just like the n-word but she said it a with the jesse raphael show was on they let it air and she didn't even flinch it was just like and she just said it you know we can't say you know it's like that word right there and they're allowed to call themselves that but we can't do it and it's the same thing with lesbian i can say it but you can't and i was just like whoa they oh, that is there second of all like that that poor woman just had to sit there and not you know and let that roll over her and i think it's just got to be drilled into people and if you got to keep saying they 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 until they get it until till the he's and she's get the they then we got to do it that way we did a show we had nick casey on um mm -hmm. on our show and um nick casey is a clothing designer and he's um and he's trans he's trans gay and, what gay they he's them. Not gay. He's they? Not gay. they them oh, he's a they them and we <sighs> used to cuss on the show a lot more than we do um and i had a cuss jar but for that night um we made it a pronoun jar and he oh, explained and he, he he literally explained to us like the pronouns and, and pretty much took us down the road and i said okay after he explained it it's they them they them and you know and and the thing that i kept saying is but it's not proper english which is where i stumble right. on it it's just not proper english it's not a collective i mean when i'm talking to you i'm not talking to all of the transgender people i'm talking to you so the way i got out of it because i kept going him him and putting more money and more money i just said fuck this hi every time i talk to him so nick so nick <laughs> <laughs> you say nick, nick. <laughs> because but you know, and then the money we donated to, you know, his, um, his fund, his, his, uh, we donated it to the transgender because he made a lot of money that night. But the reality is it's, it's just odd. Like I worked with Lorraine, Lorraine, Laura Laverne Cox, you know, and she was, she, you know, they, well, God, see, I yeah, think, I, is she, I think she goes, I think Laverne is, she goes by she. I'm almost positive too. But yeah. I'm not 100%, but she was trying to explain it to me. But, you know, as a transgender, you know, she even said, I get the they, them symbol symbolic, she said, but it's it's just not proper English. And I'm like, well, great. It is, if the Laverne Cox, one of the most famous transgenders is saying it, I'm okay. And then- but We all, we actually do it. Like if you, if someone does something to your house, whatever, well, they left litter on the, on the thing. We use it when we don't know who the pronoun is. We will occasionally. Yeah. I really feel like I get that that was proper English back in the days. However, we have to relearn proper English now. Yeah. Yeah. So for example, I'm, I'm a manager and I'm in charge of a lot of people. And when I'm talking to the group collectively as a whole, I'm like, how did, how did you guys like this? How did you guys like this? Oh, I yeah. More girls than I have guys. And as soon as it flies out of my mouth, I'm like, oh, and I said, I'm sorry. How do you all like this? How did you all like this? And it's just, it's so engraved into the, the, you know, generations that, 
or above millennials to to have the male as the the norm of mm-hmm. default as True. how are you guys doing for all right even even when you speak spanish the oh, male exactly. is the dominant yeah. and then the same thing with in any speak, language right so you know i try to speak with yeah, the, the person I went out with, the person I'm talking to, they said this. I'm trying to already start practicing that. Of course, I'm not perfect, but I'm really trying. And even just addressing everyone at, at my work, I'm really trying to say, how are you all doing? Versus how I mean, the thing talking. is, when you're in corporate mm-hmm. America, and I've been in it for a really long time, like yeah. really long time, you tend not to do the guys or gals or all that stuff you just don't i never have you know uh, and it went in doubt you know call the person's name um but you know but you know amongst my friends it's kind of like hey you know but it's true you know we this this country i i'll speak just for this country because even though i've been around i i can't i've never lived anywhere else but it always been it's always been the male the male pronoun or the male male has always dominated true. everything uh, it's everything the Think of all the poor <laughs> out there that have yeah. been called she their whole little boat life. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody, you're watching Between the Sheets here on United Broadcasting Network with Suzanne Westenhofer. Here is our guest. We're so I'm so honored. Please call in 323-524-2599. 323-524-2599. Um, Roxanne went to her therapist today, and uh, she wants to talk about boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> so i know she tried to squeak it in a few minutes ago but about boundaries but no one no one no one no one caught it so why don't you tell us about boundaries roxanne because maybe you can school us about boundaries and maybe jenny and suzanne will make it funny <laughs> let's talk boundaries people <laughs> One thing that I learned that I've been learning all year uh, from my therapist, she's really been opening up my eyes to see things, is that I give, I'm a giver and I'm an empath and I give so much of myself to where I end up sacrificing some of myself. And I never really realized how much I sacrificed of myself until she continuously has been pointing it out the first half of the year. And um, actually, can I interrupt. I can also tell you with those characteristics, because I mirror that. Um, we also are. Uh, we're, we're also are another category. It's called codependence. For me, it was December and January where it, it the lights just really went off on how much I give of myself to where mm. I'm depleted. I'm left with nothing, and then I'm. I would think to myself, Well, who's taking care of me? No one. And so she really helped me and we, we just talked about boundaries, like who's, who's taking advantage of me, who, like, if you give someone an inch, they'll take, take a mile because I'm a nice person and just really just say, no, okay, this, this isn't working for me, that this doesn't work for me, or it's not going to work for me and that it's okay. I'm not being selfish. I'm not being mean. I'm not being rude. And then I, I sit and I think about people that have told me that in the past. Um, and, and I would think like, gosh, I, I might have an adverse thought, but now I look back and I'm, I'm like, no, that person was just doing what was best for them. And I really respect that person for knowing that. Some know that I, I learned at a young age and some learn at an older age and I'm learning now just really doing what is best for me and taking care of myself and putting myself and my needs first is not selfish. And um, that's I think, what I'm But doing. I think in the culture as women, I think as women, Ingo, <laughs> as women, um, you know, growing up in the male dominated society, the women have always been the subservient. The, I mean, how many of us have not done anything wrong Mm-hmm. even amongst our own peers and if there's a discourse how many say i'm sorry oh oh yeah just to, oh, yeah. Just okay without doing anything wrong without, i'm sorry and yep. and it's like but i didn't do anything wrong yeah. Yeah. aren't you using it like i'm almost using it like excuse me right yes yeah. exactly yeah. that's right 
you know, and it's, it's, it's really hard to deprogram oneself yeah. to do that. And I also, you know, I'm a giver. I think we all are. I think most people are givers unless they're just takers and then they just need to be out of my life. Um, mm -hmm. But for the most part, you know, I think we, you give, you give to a point, but I think there's a point of giving and then over and that okay. that goes into sort of codependency mm -hmm. and people pleaser and that comes from a deeper thing of abandonment and rejection issues okay. and it's we want to be accepted everybody wants to be accepted and that happens to me and it's and you know a little bit's an ego a little bit for me is ego play i i, I don't you know i'm i'm not perfect and i got some issues but a lot of its ego is I find myself that if I'm rejected, whether it's friendship, whether whatever, if I immediately go into that, I have to go in overdrive to sort of convince them that I am worthy. Mm -hmm. And the point is, is, you know, you have to realize, you know what? I am worthy. Yeah. I am worthy. I, they don't appreciate my, appreciate me. Maybe they don't appreciate me. Maybe they don't appreciate what I bring to the table in a relationship. So maybe we're, you know, maybe that's not a good relationship, you know? So it's always looking at yourself and how many people have, when a breakup happened, okay? How many people here have said, what did I do? <laughs> right. What did I do? Why does it have to be my fault? You know, but why do we always go backwards and it's because i believe we are it's sort of it's sort of trained that way in, in in some bizarre way that we're not good enough there's got to be if something doesn't work out it's got to be our fault which is ridiculous because if there's an issue it's 50 50 you know not one person unless you beat someone or abuse them that is completely like one-sided but for the most of us we're going through life we make mistakes we make judgment calls we stumble and fall you know but it is what i think i learned in the past couple of years it's awareness oh yeah awareness to be aware and if you have made a mistake you know don't have your pride i mean then say i'm sorry oh, you know wait wait i'm gonna okay, okay. I'm a, this is my interrupting of that. I just want to say this, and it's about boundaries and everything. And I've been in therapy like a million times for a long time. I mean, I've always done it. Um, part of it, just but not all, all of it in ours, and we're only talking our society, obviously in our culture, we live in a patriarchy and that has a certain, and so everything you just said, Gant, like most women would go, uh-huh, uh-huh. And guys would be like, nah, -uh, nah, uh there's a, that's, that's been trained. And some of it is probably science and biology. There's a boy, there's a girl, they have to have kids some way they had to do some, figure it all out. Um, but the, the thing is to accept and understand that you're living under, you're living under a man's idea of what culture should be. If you remember that every day, and then like sort of ask yourself, um, well, wait, this isn't working for me. Why is that? And then, and try to look at it. The hardest part is try to look at it how you would naturally look at it from your own female perspective. And don't think about what men would want from it. Your head will explode because you go, I'm literally just doing this because this has been trained into women since the beginning of this. I don't need to do this. I don't gain it. Like my still, here I am a lesbian. I have like maybe one straight male friend. I barely even play with straight people because I'm, I've, I've, I've gotten old enough that I can be with people I like, which are lesbians. But I still find myself going, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Like we just said, that's a trained in thing and it's patriarchal. It, it, and they all are. We don't want to admit, I, I, I don't, I feel like we don't want to give men the credit but that's not what it is. It's truly their society and we've been trying to exist in it. And in order for us to feel better, we have to come out and, and, and honestly say, oh, I'm doing this not because it's comfortable for me or what I wanted to do. I'm doing this because this is what women have been expected to do, what we've been trained to do. And I think with the next the next group of young people that are coming up, I'm, they're trying, a lot of them are trying so hard to not have gender 
And I'm going, okay, okay, but wait one second. Could we have a matriarchy for just a minute? <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's not go for the, the, the utopia. Let the, let the matriarchy come into play for a little bit. Could we just like see what would happen if it were just the chicks ruling it? If we, and then and then break it down and find the best that the patriarchy might offer and the best that the uh, you know, matriarchy will offer, and then create this utopic society that doesn't care about gender. You're, they're trying. Um, try, don't try so hard to because once again, if you think about it, the women are going to be erased. Mm -hmm. We didn't get to do it in the patriarchy. If we become no gender and all that stuff, once again, what a woman feels, how we feel, what we like, what's our most natural stuff is going to go mm -hmm. again. I mean, I have to say, I, mean, I, I have to say, I mean, I'm so happy how just so far this country is moving with oh. you know, Kamala. I mean, we've got Kamala, oh. uh, Jill Biden. Let me just say, she is very sexy to me. <laughs> I find when she was on Good Morning America or something the other day, I just sat there and gazed and went, wow, if I could find one of those, I'd be happy. <laughs> I mean, you know, just one of those and perfect. But, you know, it's at least, you know, women are having a voice, you know, yeah. with this new, with this new regime, you know, it's, God, it's yeah. It's, I'm so happy that we're having, I mean, Elizabeth Warren, I still adore her. Um, you know, she was fighting the good fight. I know, I know, I know. Oh, yeah. I understand. I'm not saying, I'm glad she didn't be, she wasn't president, but there's, she did put some things in. Yeah. in the public. Get you know, she, a lot, when others, when others weren't, you know, she was out there fighting the good fight, whether you agree hundred percent of her politics, I give her kudos or whatever. Same thing with Nancy Pelosi. I mean, you know, she's got plus and minuses, but, you know, but again, you know, back in the day, you know, her, Barbara Boxer, I mean, they were Maxine Waters. These mm -hmm. were women mm -hmm. that really were at the forefront of continuing to move our agenda forward to be noticed, like notice us. And, th and they get pummeled. They get pummeled and they, it's almost like they go like this. I don't care. I know I'm going to keep women forefront and children, Nancy Pelosi. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. But if you listen to her, she never misses an opportunity to say, and the children. And the she, children. Yeah, right. But that, and that's not, I don't think that's something she just does out of habit. I mean, like she literally, this, she's going, I know what I want and I'm going to do that. And people go, boing, boing, boing. And she's like, keesh, keesh, yeah. keesh. Right? I love that. I mean, I like that she's kind of Teflon. And she's not scared. No, that she's not scared. Right. Um, but you know, but going back to boundaries and Tr and Roxanne, um, you know, it, part of the setting up of boundaries is being comfortable within yourself. Oh. You know, yes, that actually that. led the conversation on over to self esteem, mm -hmm. and oh. the <laughs> lack of self esteem is what we ended up talking about. Wears three masks. And I'm going to talk about all three masks. Not that and long, please. See, see, no, it's just about a, mi a minute or two. See which one, if any, you wear. Mask number one for a lack of self-esteem is the imposter mask. Mm. That means um, you're friendly, but you put up a front that you're you, it, because you really don't feel like you belong. You have a fear of failure that leads to a, a problem with perfection. And then it drives competition and procrastination. Then you eventually burn out. Are these your therapist notes? Yeah, they're notes that I have taken from studying on this. And then the second mask is the re rebel mask, which is you're rebellious, you're in constant anger, not feeling good enough. And so you, like, you have something to prove because uh, it's like, oh, nothing hurts me, but yet inside underneath, you're always angry. And then the last mask is the loser mask, where it's you feel helpless, unable to cope, and someone has to just come to your rescue. So those are the three masks that a lack of self-esteem um, people can wear with a lack of self-esteem. Someone could have just one, two, or all three. Okay. I got to say, I, you know, for me, you know, I, I mean, look, I think we all have a little lack of self-esteem. I think we all do. As women, I think sort of as women, we always do. I think that's just the, 
yeah, check, you know, check, like I said, the check. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, when I'm good at something, I shine, you know, it's like, and I think we all do. And so I think a lack of self esteem for me, maybe sometimes comes a little bit in the dating world <laughs> because I've not been successful with that. But I mean, in business and other stuff, you know, I'm, a, I mean, you know, I am so self-confident that, you know, I mean, I'm sure that's why we excel. That's, I think that's why all of us excel in what we do in our business sense, because we have that self-esteem and that cockiness in a way, because we know we're good at what we do. Otherwise we wouldn't be doing it. And we certainly wouldn't be recognized for doing it. So I think a lot of the mask wearing for me comes more in personal life, but you know, I don't like, you know, the, the, the loser, you know, I'm sitting, I, I've never thought of myself as a loser and I'm not, never, 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 never. Um, what the first one was the imposter. The imposter. imposter. I think you a know, lot of people do that one. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I guess, although I'm pretty blunt and, and when I was younger, I think maybe I wore that mask pretty easy because hi, hi, hi. And now if I'm engaged in a conversation and I've been told this, I, I don't think it is, but they're like, oh, you so didn't like that person or, oh, you were so bored. I'm like, what did I do? You can read your face and your body language like a book. Throw, even your smile is, you know, it's like fake, you know? So, I mean, but I think, you know, we're human. And I think, you know, I don't think there's any one person and I'm not a therapist. I can't see besides maybe Donald Trump and he's misguided. I don't really think there's anyone that has like a hundred percent like every day wakes up and go, I love myself. Yeah. It, yeah. it just can't. I mean, Roxanne. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. It, uh, a lot of, so the, the self, lack of self-esteem and the confidence that we have are on, on two different boats, basically. The lack of self-esteem stems more from what we didn't get when we were kids. Like right. if we didn't feel understood or loved by our parent or feel valued or that feel like our parents actually trusted us and trusted our opinion, then that's where the lack of the self-esteem comes. Because my confidence is most definitely over the top in many things because I know I have decades of experience in certain areas and I know where I'm really good at. So, so it's, it's like, it's kind of like two different hats and, and I didn't really understand that until today. I just thought, oh, someone with a lack of self-esteem lacks confidence, but no, it's actually two separate hats. One stems from childhood, not getting what we need from parent. And the other one stems from what we're good at because we have decades of experience. What did your therapist say about the masks? Like you're, you're not supposed to wear any of them. You're supposed to address them. You're so, I mean, what was the, the point of, of the math, mask that and my masks better have rhinestones on them. Otherwise, I'm wearing shit. <laughs> it's, it's actually just getting down to the bottom of it. It's getting down to, okay, where did this come from? Um, you know, what was it in the childhood? Like, did your parents let, neglect you? Did you feel um, not heard? Did you feel not trusted? Did you feel not valued to where you never felt like you belonged and uh, you never felt like you fit in? And then, so that's why as adults with certain friend groups, you don't feel like you belong. You don't feel like you fit in, even though you're with the friend groups and you're having a good time and you're all laughing together, deep down inside, you kind of still don't feel like you belong or fit in. But you know, as children, you know, as kids, we perceive things sometimes completely differently yeah. than yeah. what they are. Very much so. And it's like, you know, I, I mean, you know, I was raised, I'm an only child. So, you know, we weren't rich, but I thought I was. Um, because I got everything I wanted. So I grew up thinking I was rich, <laughs> not so much. Um, but, you know, and they, my parents, you know, con consist consistently and constantly praised me and allowed me to do things and, and gave me opportunities. So, I mean, I, you know, oh, you're so smart. Oh, you're so this, or you're so that. And what was funny growing up, I used to question that. They were genuine. But I used to question it because my answer was, oh, of course they're going to tell me I'm pretty. 
Of mm-hmm. course, they're going to tell me I'm smart. They're my parents. Like, what are you going to say? Well, where did that come from, though? Right. Where did that? Where did that? Doubt- Who the hell knows? It's doubting. It's doubting. It's like why? Why did I doubt my parents? Or you know? So and, and it's like. I don't know where that came from. I mean, we're still stumped about it, but like, it's kind of like how, where did I develop in my child brain that really has an experience life to sort of look at it from that respect and automatically undercut it to a negative thing? Um, the, the thing about um, therapy, psychology, and, and the things that Roxanne was talking about and all that other stuff is it's very easy you know, to, to try to make these, uh, situations that we all fit into but the truth is um you if you have three kids raised exactly the same they're still going to turn out different differently and i think a lot of that too is and we just don't know what to do yet with it is you you we don't know how much each child absorbs mm-hmm. I heard this, you know, and my sister heard it, but she took it this way and she was this way. But it could be just as simply as that when she heard it, she was turning and facing the person and felt their genuineness. But when I heard it, I was shorter <laughs> looking up and thought, oh, wow, they're sort of a god and they're saying this negative thing. Mm-hmm. We don't know all those things. You have to be open enough to allow that. And um, like if you, have a bad self ego or have you have some bad problem and you're going to a therapist um uh, you and the therapist and i've always thought this and been told that you have to work together to find out what your how did you get to this we constantly try to go and this is what happens when this happens and this is what happens with this but it may not look at your personal life own it recognize and go and so i can look at things and go i was the third child and we were poor but my dad had left by then so and my mom was working so i got a lot of freedom so i feel completely more free than my sisters who are like rule followers <laughs> and so, but don't get all hung up in that instead get hung up on like meaning obviously it's good to know where you came from and recognize it and stuff obviously um and then but fine what are you doing now what are you doing now for you what are you doing now for um your best friends or the people that are in your life to make this better right doing it to move forward to be amazing because looking back can give you information and then what what are you doing with it but that's your old story you know people you know i have a really hard time with people you know and i call it spirituality but it's growth you know and we always should strive to grow and oh. tap into the past yeah but we can't live in the past because you become stagnant and you know me and my friends call it okay that's the old story you can't keep repeating the old story to move forward you know change is hard change change, change is hard and it's tough and sometimes when you you know to be so i'm trying to be more flexible and trying to see other people's point of views now mind you you know I like, I am very opinionated. I have got my point of view from the way I see it. And then I'm sitting there going, well, you know, I know more than these people. Uh, That's just a little bit ego, but you know, but when you break it down, bottom line, it's about listening and communication. And for me, you know, I, oh, I am the big proponent of communication and listening, you know? And I'm the one who my friends call to listen. I mean, I listen, I listen. They ask for my opinion. Sometimes they don't, I give it anyway. They already know that they're gonna get it if you're gonna call me. Otherwise just tell me yeah. right after that. Don't give me your opinion um, because I am a problem solver and I used to be a fixer, um, which I'm trying to get out of that pattern too. But you know, the thing is, it, I learned, I thought about this and it's like, you know what? I don't really listen. I don't. I'm really not listening. I'm hearing what they're saying, but if what they're saying isn't in the in like the way I, from my point of view, I'm going to fight because no one's going to tell me what to do and no one's going to change me. Because that was my thing. You're not going to change me. I am who I am. Mm-hmm. But it's very basic is to listen. If someone says I don't like, I don't like you doing this or I don't like this, why am I fighting it? Why not just go? Okay. Yeah. 
yeah. how hard is that? It should, it should be so easy to say that, but it's so easy to revert to, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Or that's you, that's not me, I'm not gonna. Oh, projection drives me fucking nuts. Take responsibility, people. That's yeah. another thing. Take for, you know, take responsibility for your actions or for your words. I mean, you know, I mean, I used to have a bad temper, not physical, but I used to have a bad temper. And the way I, the way I sort of cut someone up is with my mouth. Oh, um, me too. I am, I mean, there's nothing as, I mean, my tongue is slicker than a perfectly sharpened knife because I will go right for that jugular. And the reason why I do that is not because I'm an asshole. I mean, maybe I'm a little bit of an asshole, but the more you hurt me, yeah, the more you hurt me inside, because maybe I'm emotionally involved, the more you hurt me, the harder I lash out because it's out of hurt. Right. Oh, absolutely. And we, we also, we do it like, um, I've, I got into a habit and I saw it finally through therapy. Um, I'm going to hurt you before you get a chance. Ah, right. You know what I mean? Like before you, like I see you and I have the same tongue thing, you know what I mean? Where words, 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 and you know, and you go for to do that right away. As soon as you're starting to feel anything for the person. You know what I mean? Because you're afraid, like, they're not going to return it. Maybe you don't think well of yourself or you just don't think. So you go and you whack because, the, and that's, these are all just defenses. They're all just ways to exist in the world. And we're all just trying to exist. And then we break it down to each culture trying to exist in the rules that the wealthy and the male in every culture, every color, every religion. The wealthy and the male are telling us how to interpret this stuff. And we just keep doing it because we don't, what are we, we're just trying to exist. Well, hopefully, hopefully we're moving into that <laughs> divine female energy. Hopefully we're moving more into that <laughs> heart space, that heart brain, you know, hopefully we're, we're setting boundaries with our energy saying, what matters to me? Like, where am I spending my energy and what am I going to allow or not allow? And really the power of no with compassion and all of that is really, I think, where we're moving to. And, and the pendulum that you mentioned earlier about the masculine to the, to the no. no gender, I think it's going to swing, but I think it's going to find that divine female. I think that's what's coming out now is that empathy that we all have. We're all... And I think, you know, we're all very sensitive and even men and, and but, but women, uh, we're learning that uh, our sensitivity is a power and it's an energy and we need some of that, right? We need some for ourselves. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I what if it's, it's, go ahead, it's, it's going to be kind of like, like we we're talking about the young generation, not liking labels and as much as we might mock all their different terms for everything in a way, it's kind of like there will be what we call a feminine energy, what we call the feminine power, but it's just, instead of giving it a, an A or a B and only those options, because everyone is fluid. Nobody is, you know, all super hyper one thing and all, all hyper another. So it's, it's like, I think we're all, ideally, if we could all just be, we wouldn't need to have that quote unquote feminine energy. We would mm -hmm. have gravitate toward those who shared what used to be called in 21 the feminine energy in you know hopefully a few years will just be that kind of a thing and maybe it won't yeah. be and i think in a way i sort of respect that that generation's lack of wanting to give anything a label and if a guy wants to wear a skirt but bang every woman in town good for him you know yeah. and jenny i'm sorry i worry like i'm sorry if we um, only because of science. Um, I don't want to take away the male. I don't want to take away the female. And by the way, um, I feel 100% female. I never feel anything toward men at all. Like I don't have a male energy or anything. I don't even want it. It sounds, <laughs> I think it smells funny. Um, but, if, the if, room. Right? but if we, if we, um, if we have where we're all like neutral and all that stuff. My my biggest fear is just as human beings, then we will just be, pe we'll just like exist. Where will art come from? Where will poetry and music 
and all that stuff. I feel like you, you have to keep the up and down, the whatever it is. Why would, why would having a, a masculine or feminine-ish label on things, why would that affect art in any way? The duality. But not having, I meaning I don't want to aim for, is that, what I'm, is that what I'm saying, Cheryl? I don't want to aim for where there's just, we're just human beings. Because I feel like then we'll, it, it's almost like I feel, then we're like mashed potatoes. Like there's just no definition. Maybe, maybe, we're, good too. maybe we're lifting Our to a higher mind or a higher oh. consciousness of the male, female. Oh. How about, let's just take this on to think. How about maybe this is what we needed? Yeah. Maybe, and we, we clearly couldn't go from male to female, right? Nice. So then the millennials are going from male to they, them, to break away from the male to get to a they, them. And then once we get there, we could get to the female. And then flip it. I love that. Yep. Maybe the female is the final destination. Maybe we are meant it has been for all of us. But mm -hmm. at the end, maybe it is going to be female. And it's, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's fine. It, it's, it's all fine. I mean, I'm, uh, look, I'm a woman. I enjoy being a woman. Um, you know, I'm not an ultra femme. I identify as a femme. Mm -hmm. There's not one male thing in my body, except when I walk into my office. <laughs> got to be, I've got to play with the boys so mm -hmm. that whatever masculine it's not even masculine it's just that a self self-confidence that assertiveness has to come out to be heard to be acknowledged you can't just sit there mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i won't do it i won't do it so i mean that's where i guess that energy comes out is in my business i mean and it does too in personal but you know i um but i, I don't I think they're masculine or feminine though that's weak and strong. That's not masculine and feminine necessarily. I mean, I agree. True. but we, what has happened is because a certain cultures have taken over they they define one as masculine as one as feminine. That is what happened. Um, but you, we all know sitting here, men who are very feminine. I just did it feminine in their way of being like I just did it I described it and you knew what I meant when I said feminine a little softer a little more whatever we knew um but that's that's literally just that's culture that's not science of us that's like and we're creating it right but it's labeling too because how many people I mean I don't know that's how we find stuff isn't that a you know it's just weird because how many people if there's an actor and you see an actor on the screen and they're not you know freaking like Sylvester Stallone or that type of manly chest beating man, you know, and they're just a little bit more softer. How many straight people are going, oh, he must be gay. I mean, seriously. Or if there's a strong woman or there's a strong woman, oh, she must, I heard she's a lesbian. I mean, it's like, it's like automatically these labels are put on. Now, Suzanne, for you, I mean, when did you come out? Like in comedy, when you started, did you come out of the gate right away and say, hi, I'm a lesbian comedian? Yeah. So you didn't yeah. do the hiding part like Ellen and then just come out later. No, I didn't. Because I, no, I did it. But the, that's because I didn't, I did it on purpose. Like, remember, I thought I was going to be an actor. That didn't work out. All of a sudden you're a bartender in Secaucus, New Jersey. It's year eight. I know, you know, Secaucus. I was born in North Burr in Hoboken. Go ahead. Yeah, all that on you. And I'm all like, and so, but, and I was super out and it was the AIDS crisis was in the middle of all that. And I would go into these things. I'd be like gay pride and gay rights. And I was part of act up and queer nation. And then remember the lesbian Avengers and, <laughs> and I was doing all this. And then, um, somebody said, uh, oh, you're funny. And then why don't you, and I'm like, and they were like, why don't you do stand up? And I was like, um, when am I going to get up there and say, do jokes about my boyfriend? You know, like it would be a lie. And I've never lived a lie. I've been very proud of that. Right. And he, he was basically like, yeah, you don't want to try it. I mean, because I was like, I can't do that. You wouldn't get any work. You won't be successful. And the guy said, and I always remember because he turned, he goes, yeah, because you'll never get another bartending job. And it was such a cut because a bartender is anybody can be a bartender almost. Right. And I was like, oh, shit, but he's right. What was I risking to get up? and say, and make jokes about being a lesbian and, and that stuff. And I was risking nothing. I had nothing. I was living in an apartment in North Bergen. You know what I mean? I did nothing. So I lived in North Bergen. 
Are you lying? No, I two lived in North Bergen. Field Park. Oh my God. Okay. So I grew up on 88th and 4th in North Bergen. Went to Holy Rosary in Union City. Seriously? Yes. Okay. And I lived there for 10 years. So I, I truly thought, um, okay, well then, because activism is natural to me. Like I, I led a, a, a getting mad at our uh, cafeteria because they wouldn't offer a salad bar so that the wrestling kids, the wrestler boys were starving themselves, uh, just stupid stuff. So that's natural to me. So I used that natural activism and I got up and I was like, uh, I guess I'll be the only lesbian comedian tonight. Everybody laughs, you know what I mean? And I go, and then I continue on with the joke. And at that, at that time, it was, um, uh, I, you, look, you expected someone who looked like Leona Helmsley, right? That's an old school. And, and I get a laugh and then they would be like, oh wait, she's serious. I have found that the change we need to enact from my standpoint, the way I get change done or that I create change or help change is through laughter, getting people to laugh, relax, Oh my God, I guess lesbians aren't that bad, which is basically what I was getting them to say in the 90s. Oh, I guess lesbians aren't all, don't all hate men, remember that? They all hate men, and or they all want to be men. There was all these things, and I could yell and scream, right? But that, that, don't, that has its place, but it doesn't, you know what I mean? For me, the way it kind of, and I feel like for everyone, I wanted to I make them laugh and then they would listen to me when I was sneaking in stuff like, you know, lesbians or this and we're better at this and we've got this. They never even heard it. And then all of a sudden they're thinking that way because I and that's how that was my way of activism. Of, you know, what I mean, July 31st, 1990 at Can I Kelly share my screen? Can I share my screen? Yeah, yes. Oh. Can she? Oh, can you? You need to make her a co-host. Wait, what? Christian, are you there? Yeah. What's she doing? Who wants to share her screen? Can oh. you do it? Share my screen? Who wants to share? Who wants to share the screen? Is it up? No. Let me know when they hit play. Now it is. Okay, you're a co host. You can go now. Share screen. At the bottom oh, I got to share screen myself. Okay, hang on. Yeah, you uh, go to the bottom of your yeah. screen. Yeah, hold, please. Oh, okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. Sorry, I'm going to do this. No worries. Okay. There we go. You got to get it? Go. You getting it? Yep. Hang on. Here we go. Shared screen. <gasps> no. Oh, my. Wow. Oh, Is there a volume? <laughs> Look at Suzanne's face. <laughs> Great hair. That oh, hair is great. No, old stop. Hold on. In style at the time. I get it. Oh, I, I love it. Like I it. remember that hair. I had it. We all did. Most of yeah. us did. Oh my, oh my god, I can't get it to stop. Sorry, guys. I couldn't. That's by the way, that's what my mom's been saying. Oh, uh, anyway. Um <laughs> I, I couldn't hear what I said. I'm just yeah. assuming. What's funny is I spent the whole time watching that, Jenny, which I haven't seen in 20 years or more, um, looking at that hair and makeup and going, <laughs> but you know. You couldn't hear it? I couldn't. I oh. couldn't either, but the people, yeah, I I the people watching it did. Hopefully. I'm not sure what annoying opinion I thought was better than everybody else's that I was throwing out there. Oh, but shoot, I'm so sorry, you guys, yeah. You were just, well, now I can't hear anybody. Oh. Hello. Hello, yep. Jenny, can you hear us? 
I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. We can hear you now. I mean, so Good. Susan, like that was for that that was there. Then you like was David was the Letterman show the first like like besides that was that after this? Yeah, right after. Yeah. And you actually went on and did stand up, right? Okay. No, the first time I ever did stand up was July of 1990. I was on Sally Jesse. Um, that was January of 91. So it was like six months. I mean, I had literally been doing stand up for six months. My career was crazy lucky, crazy for where I just went. I never middled. I never substituted. I never did anything. I went headliner. It was whack. So how like, were you discovered? Like how, like who discovered you or who sort of took you and brought you to that next level? Like immediately. Um, the the lesbians and the gay men meaning they all went oh my god will you are you willing to say that at our um thing that we're doing for to raise money for whatever you know what i mean are you willing and it was you know gay people oh my god will you say that at our gay pride and then you're at like syracuse new york gay pride and there's nine of you you know what i mean total in the 90s remember this is a very yeah. different thing. and um and I was willing absolutely to say it anywhere and wanted to. I wanted the attention. I love that. So I was getting famous doing stand up and I had never even thought about being a stand up. That was like, what? I'm not a stand up. That's like something else. I'm a great actor that I have as a bartender. You know? And um, it, ju it just it worked because I, I wanted the attention and I wanted all that. Right. And so I was getting all that, and I was absolutely, I had. I was never in the closet, not for a minute, had sex with a girl, talked to my mom like a week later and was like, I'm a lesbian. And I had, for real, and I had been, um, uh, what what I say in my act, um, uh, oh, a, a good, no, a careful homosexual, I can't, or a heterosexual, I was a whore, a little bit of a slut from 14 to 18 and 19 when I decided, you know, and so I, I don't have any coming out story. I'm not, I was never closet. I don't have any of that, but I wanted to use that advantage that I was given to make it better for everyone who is closeted, can accept it, has religious parents or, you know, whatever their thing is, I wanted to make that better. And that's, that was literally my whole purpose was to make it so that, um, lesbians oh. would see it and be okay. That's awesome. I'm good. Hey, well, we have a caller. Let's see who's calling. Woohoo! What if it's Sally Jess? That'd be awesome. Wouldn't it be funny? God, how young she looks. Hey, Hello, uh, everybody. Hello, welcome to Between the Sheets. Who's calling? Hey, hey, thanks very much. This is Joe Papa Dennis. Hey, Joe. <laughs> I've got. Hi, hi. Um, I'm glad we're on comedy because when I was calling in before and we were on the other theoretical stuff, I wasn't sure what to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Suzanne, um, you talked about how, you know, somebody said, hey, you're funny. You should be stand up when you were bartending or, you know, in the cafeteria or whatever. Well, there must have been a point earlier on when you were funny, right? At home or whatever. Can you mm -hmm. remember? Um, I mean, was there a choice when you were a kid that you like used that? As, I mean, where's the story behind that story? Is Which there. As a, you mean to be a comic? Yeah, like when you were a kid, it sounds like maybe there was a lot of confidence since you came out so early to your mom, like, boom, there I, here I am. But mm. uh, where, when you were really young, when you started to be funny, do you remember when you first started that and, and um, why you went that route? I mean, as kind of a natural? I wanted, I wanted the attention. That was my main goal since I could stand and hold my head up. And I did it first through uh mimicking dances i saw on television or mimicking a song you know what i mean right and it was any way i could get attention so i thought it was going to be acting like oh. that make the sense and of course acting is very difficult and then all of a sudden i'm you know i'm in jersey and i'm bartending at the hula hands in Secaucus. and um can i just interrupt for a second do you know the hagen does across the street yes. i was the manager no! <laughs> oh my god I crazy God, that's whack. Okay, that's whack. We probably know it, like knew each other. So I'm like, uh, so uh, I'm a bartender to live, you know, to pay my rent, to eat, right? And then, um, like I said, and I and you entertain. I would entertain. I was I worked Monday through Friday, open through happy hour, which is all the, uh, quite frankly, the alcoholics, but um, all the people who men who had jobs, you know, at the corporations that are around there. And I wanted to make money, so I did and said things to make them laugh and keep them coming in for me, right? That was all about money, you know, to live. 
And it was a guy who said to me, and I, he, I see, he said something like, you, you, you're, um, you're as funny as this guy I saw on HBO last night. You should do stand up. And I'm like, I'm not trained. I don't know how to do that. I don't know anything. And, um, and then I said to him, what am I supposed to do? Do jokes like I do here where I tell you, because like it was a completely straight bar and everyone was straight. And, but what if a guy came in and there was like five seats between him and another guy came in and there was nobody else, I would come out and do things like, oh, are we fighting today, boys? <laughs> This is the 80s, no idea. People were shocked into laughter. Do you know what I mean? They were like, how is this girl? And I had a guy come in once who he, he was like, hey, hey, Suzanne, hey, Suzanne, come here. This is Tony. Tell him. Tell him what you told me. She eats a pussy. She's like a, a lesbian. Tell him. Tell her. He, they, and they thought it was like a sideshow. <laughs> so much attention. You know, and I was an activist. Yeah. So it, it, like it worked? Yeah. Mm. Well, I have to say, I mean, you just say that acting was so hard. I mean, to be a stand-up comedian, I would think would be majorly difficult. I mean, it's all on you. That's I it. I miss, I made, miss, what I meant was that um, getting ahead as an actor in New York, like getting an agent and getting auditions and all that, that was not happening. That was very, you know what I mean? I wasn't getting seen. I didn't, uh, another blonde, blue-eyed girl from the farm country. Uh. Yeah, sure. You know, and so um, uh -huh. I meant it was that was hard in that, you know, I wasn't I didn't have an agent. I didn't have I wasn't getting anything. I couldn't do anything. And um, so I was bartending for my living. I didn't mean that acting is harder than comedy. Gotcha. Here's a best friend. Here's a best friend. They're all watching me out there. Thank you. <laughs> I love you. Thank you. <laughs> and then so I. Uh, what, what I mean, well, so acting is not harder or different than comedy. I'm just saying that uh, for being funny came natural. That's a, that must be a, uh, something I have inside me, like being able to sing, right? You, you don't know why. Um, and so I just was, and I was just, and I was this activist, and so I would make everybody laugh. And then they were like, they basically, this guy basically challenged me. Well, like, go do this open mic and be be like you are here in the bar when you're making us laugh about your lezzy stuff. And I was like. All right, he's right. You know, I if I'm let's put this on the table. If I'm and I didn't think I would make it as a comic. I didn't think I'd be a comic. I didn't think it would be my life until I had been making my living doing stand up for like and this no joke, two years, three years, and I went, oh, I, I guess I'm going to be doing this forever. <laughs> I'm not. It wasn't my. It wasn't my. It wasn't what I thought. Well, you know the difference for me between a comic and an actor is. A comic for so a comic is really authentic. It's the authentic. That is really different skills, right? One is you're literally playing someone else and making you believe it's authentic, and a comic is being authentic and making you laugh. Correct. And a, and, and a comic also has to throw down their vulnerabilities because it's throwing out, it's putting out your vulnerabilities out there, and yeah. making, like you said, <clears throat> making it like the norm or at least showing people it's normal in this case being a lesbian is really normal it we're looks different we don't we look the same we look the same and that's what i really love about comedy is the authenticity behind it and you know they always say comics are very insecure look i work in tv they yeah. take a lot of comics and they put them you know, in their own shows, Ray Romano. I mean, I worked on that show. I mean, I, I went down the list of, you know, comics that had their own shows on CBS. And, you know, and, you know, they go, oh, comics are more insecure than actors. And, and I always disagree. I think comics actually are more, as we said, authentic and secure than actors because you are putting yourself out there. There's no mask. Mm -hmm. There's no barrier. It's like there's no props. There's nobody else. You go out your bare ass naked, and you're going for X amount of minutes, mm -hmm. whether it's three minutes or when I do my show, and I'm doing ninety minutes, a hundred minutes. You know, I'm doing like two hours, and you're saying I will keep your attention, and you will pay attention to me for this amount of time is bold ass bullshit. Even now thinking about it, I'm going, what the? F I'm how long have I been doing it? I'm still going, what, what? But it, you got to be bold. You got to know that. But you also have to be good because you can be bold and all that stuff and get out there and you suck. Uh oh. 
But you, that, and that's not a bad thing. I'm just saying that may not be your thing, but you're, you, you're, do, you're out there and you're bold and you're doing it and you never get ahead for whatever reason. The fates smiled at me and went, this is how you're bold and aggressive and you, you're going to take for the underdog and you're going to get out there and be an activist. Oh, and you're also, because I can't sing, for example, you're also an amazing stand-up, like you're going to be able to be make people laugh. I was able to go this, and why am I doing this with my hands, by the way, the whole freaking show? Does anybody know? New Jersey thing, because you're not Italian, so. I, no, I'm not. I'm, uh, I'm Scandinavian, which was a little bit of a shock. I thought I was German. Another, another, another story for another time. 23 and me? Yes. <laughs> and so, I, I mean, like, I, a lot of it is absolutely just extraordinary fortune and timing. Also, think about it. When I started in 1990, there was uh, four openly lesbian stand-up comics in the world. Ooh, who were they? Um, it, uh, it would be uh, Kate Clinton. Um, uh, uh, Marga Gomez, Leah Delaria, Leah Williams. Um, I, I know I'm forgetting somebody. Um, but you know, like that was it, and they were not getting the uh, chance for whatever reason. And I'm sure it's because I was a white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl. Hello, right? They were not getting the opportunity to do right. it in, in the clubs and get mainstream success and they were making their living and doing extraordinary things at women's festivals and all their stuff. I saw them. I was a fan. Um, and I, like I said, again, it all just fortune. It was all just the, the luck of it. And I was able to make that happen. You know what I mean? How, how, how did your, I'm sorry to interrupt, but how did your family react back in the nineties? Did they laugh or did they roll their eyes and cringe no. or what? My mom said to me after one of my big, a big show I had in like the first year or two, and I was getting, you know, like a thousand dollars. I mean, it was like crazy. You know, like it was, it was, it was like a million dollars or something. And my mom said, honey, it's like you get paid for what you used to have to move your desk out into the hallway for. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. True. That, that used to get me having to go to the principal. What used to get me, you know, talking out making people laugh. I was not a class clown I mean like being the smart shit being a smart shit but um now I was making my living doing it what you don't want to encourage that you know what I mean in children or teens or anything that can't be good so uh and uh my mom and dad are divorced um and that was I was two when my dad left my mom so I he may have I understand now because I'm old and now I'm re I'm finding out things about my dad who's been dead for like five years that he actually was very proud and very excited because he liked performers. He thought maybe he could be one for like a minute. You know what I mean? So he was th who knew? Didn't care. But even so, but, even when you you were coming out in I'm not saying coming out as a lesbian, but just coming out 81 90. But there was not a lot of women comedians. Period. Well, period. Bingo. I mean, you know, if, and it's so funny because my mother had an album. Oh, God. It was a woman. It was an al was a, a album. It, could, it wasn't a 78. And it was a Rusty Something. Wait, no. Oh, I've heard of. Oh, my God. I can see her. The redhead. The redhead. Rusty oh. Something. And she had this little stack yeah. of albums. And I mean, I remember going through her albums because I've always been like music. And I, I came across this rusty person and waited, not understanding what these like 10 albums were. So they went out and I'm sitting there and it's like the old 1950s. You open it up and you pull out the record player oh and you put it on and you put the thing and you go press and it goes. Bink, bing, and it was comedy. And she was so racy. Huh? And I was like. Oh my God. And it was funny. I mind you, some of it went over my head because I was a kid, but it was amazing. And in that, there was Rusty, there was some other, um, Toady Fields. Toady Fields. Toady Fields. Joan Rivers. Joan yep. Rivers. Mm. Um, there wasn't a lot, but I think, yeah, Joan Rivers, though. I think that has Tom to be. <clears throat> yeah. But I mean, the thing is, it was really funny. Like, you know, and then like Lisa Lampanelli. Wow. I don't know. I mean, I've worked with her for a minute, but you know, for her, she was one that like I never heard of her. All of a sudden, you know, she she was everywhere. 
And I didn't find her funny. All she kept talking about is like a black man's penis. I mean, that's what, and, and I know the gay boys just loved her, loved her. But where is she now? I mean, seriously, um, where the hell is she now? I, don't know. I mean, granted, no one's anywhere with COVID. But it was kind of like, you know, it's like there are some comedians that come out there, they make a splash, they get their money or whatever, and then they kind of like go away. But, you yeah. know, but they would go away for whatever reason, they go away. Mm -hmm. Um, because Lisa oh. Lanelli shtick, I'm sorry, now with all the stuff that's going on, yeah, would yeah, so yeah. not work, yeah, so not work. Because you know, look, I accept uh, pushing boundaries, yeah. being politically incorrect, that's okay. But even Joan Rivers, some of her shit would not work now yeah. at all. Um, I, I, I'm, can, I'm just going to say, Gan, thank you for taking my call, Suzanne. Thank you for answering the uh, questions. And I, I think that the hand thing really, all the hand interaction works really well visually. So it's good. Thank you. Hey, Joe, hey, Joe you call in every time. You might as well be on the show. You're going to have to come in. <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get off so somebody else can get on. But thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, Barbara Farley. I don't know if she's still on. She says, I have a Jersey question. Barbara, if you're on, you know Barbara? No, I said I only lived there 11 years. I feel badly. I, I was there from 1963 when I was born till I left in 1985, 86. So, um, Barbara, why don't you call in 323-524-2599? Um, Rusty oh, Warren. I just looked it up. Who is it? Yeah, Rusty that was Warren. it. Rusty Warren. And it was just, I mean, it's just so funny. Um, but so Suzanne, so, you know, you were a trailblazer. You still are. Um, what, I mean, what does your future look like? Like, what do you want to do? Like, what haven't you done that you, you want to aspire to do? This is so pathetic, but it's still true. I want to have a sitcom that absolutely looks at the way and Jenny and I are good friends and don't only live a few miles apart. That looks how, at like how lesbians really live. Meaning, and, and find, because I found the humor in it by not, I didn't make us bigger than life or anything. You know what I mean? But we are special and different. I, you know, I, and I'm, I'm, yeah, maybe better. I said it, I'm good. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, I would like, I want to have a sitcom where, and by now, this is so sad, I'm because I'm older than everyone here. I just turned 60, y'all. No, you didn't. Oh. That just happened in March. Okay. Oh, hold on. Barbara Farley is calling in. Hold on. I, I called Barbara on the carpet. Barbara Farley's calling in. Okay, let's have Barbara on the line. Barbara, hey, is that you? This is me. Hi, how are you? Welcome to Between the Sheets. Hey, guys, how are you? Good. Good. Okay, I have a question for you. Um, I don't know what everybody's age bracket is. Uh, hey, how are you? I'm married between 40 and death. Does that narrow it down? <laughs> well, I was actually born and raised in New Jersey. Um, and I was born in 62. So I was born in 63. 61. Okay. okay. <laughs> Um, my question, wait, I can hear myself on the thing. Let me love, shut that off. Mm -hmm. My question is, um, I lived in Middlesex County. And at the time growing up, there really wasn't like a place for like, if you were gay, anywhere to go. So my question is like, if you, for you guys that lived in Jersey, was there like a specific place that you would go? Because we'd always take the ferry and go over into New York because we knew there was places to go for gay people. Mm -hmm. But in Middlesex County, there was no like gay bars or like there was really no place for uh, gay people to like hang out with each other. Wait, isn't um, where I, there was a place in the eighties that I went to that I think was in East Orange. There was a place in one of the Montclairs, meaning I found them in, I gotta say, I found them in the eighties um, around New Jersey, but yeah, we, we generally went into Manhattan too. And then of course, Philadelphia, if you were on that section of jersey i mean i never went to a jersey club because i hated new jersey i thought new jersey people were so backward and i was so far ahead of them so i would always you know i was in tutson county so we always went to the city but oh, yeah. i didn't go to gay bars at all i never went to a gay still to this day i've never been to a gay bar in new york where i used to well i went to the saint but 
I used to hang out at Studio 54, the Limelight, Visage, right, um, the Red <laughs> Parrot. Yeah, yeah, I I used to hang out in what they were called these straight bars. But the reality is, in the eighties when I was there, you know, and I went into Limelight, it never felt like a straight bar. There were men together, women together, everybody together. You know, and I and that is I think part of how I grew up, sort of open minded, and thinking when I came out that it was okay okay to come out. Because I never saw that sort of segmentation mm -hmm. in the clubs. I thought it was okay. So it wasn't like all of a sudden, you know, I go to straight clubs, go to straight clubs, and all of a sudden I go into the limelight, which was my second home. And I'm like, oh, two women kissing, two men kissing. Oh my God, four people, you know, making out or doing mini orgy on the couch in the back. Or it That's never nice. phased me. It never phased me because it was to me, natural and normal because everybody in that space was accepting of it mm -hmm. yeah true yeah and i thought new jersey was kind of backward and and i gotta say so was la when i came out here in 1986 mm -hmm. coming from new york living a year in london because in london it, europe was always at least in london in the 80s very open-minded um as much as new york could be and was i come out here and i go into a straight club thinking I'm going to find that same sort of vibe. Absolutely yeah. fucking not. It was straight, you know? And then I was like on the search for gay clubs in California. I was the first lesbian bar I went to, and it was club 22 in North Hollywood. And that was on Lanker show. Yes. And then that was a little later. And oh, then, you know, and then the palms was always a staple. And then there was little Frida's and then girl bar came along. And then there was palette with Caroline clone. We've all been there. We all, this is our, this is our background. And the issue is it's so, you know, I, there's no lesbian bars at all in Los Angeles at all. I, I don't think in Southern California at all. No, anywhere. Anyway. And I, and I was very confused with that. Now, Barbara, are you in California now? Or are you in still Jersey? No, nah, I'm actually, well, I went from New Jersey to California in 1990 and I stayed for 12 years. And now, and but I found that Los Angeles, that was like my place because it was so much different than Jersey and uh, you could be like openly gay and they had like a lot of gay bars, like, you know, like off of Santa Monica. And it was just, I thought it was very trendy and I felt very at home, mm -hmm. but now I'm in West Virginia. <laughs> now I'm, wow. Um, wow. You just went back. But I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. yeah, but I, I found, you know, I found my wife in West Virginia, so it's like, oh, okay. you know, you got to go, you know, got to go where it is. But like my time in Los Angeles were my best times because everyone is, if you have like, you know, two mothers or, you know, you're gay or whatever you are, like I found them more accepting than it was living in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, no doubt. I mean, you know, like, I, I mean, I, again, I wasn't openly gay. I didn't know what I was when I was in New Jersey. So I didn't really, but I knew I was different. I knew I was different. Yes. You know, I knew I, I was went to Catholic different. school my whole life and I was Me like too. in love with a nun. I'm like, there's something wrong here. Okay. That was, that was, I didn't go there. I was in love with the Spanish teacher and she was not a nun. Um, she was Cuban. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, you know, I, I was, you know, we were talking to a few of my friends about the plight of the, you know, the lesbian bars. Cause there's, you know, there's guy bars, but the lesbian bars. And then I was talking to a younger generation. And they said, well, why is there a need for that anymore? Because, you know, we're accepted. You know, we're accepted. We don't need to have our own space anymore. And, you know, and, and I, I, I get it, but I don't get it. No, because when we get together, we're do and we cre we can create a women energy, and there's something that's different. And we listen to me. I learned, and I learned at the foot of separatist lesbians in the '80s and the '90s. The same way, because they would say you go to a festival, and they would say this space is just for women of color, or this space is just for Asian lesbians, and some white women, of course, would go, "Why do they need that? We're all just lesbians, whatever." You know what? It's okay to have these spaces where you. Because once again, I feel like I'm just saying this over and over again, we are living in a patriarchy under a white 
male wealth rule. So everyone who doesn't fit in that place sometimes needs to get with the others so that we can go, everything is good. And there's something that happens when women, I just went through it like four days ago. My stepmother, my sister, we were helping a goat give birth, you know, like you do. And, uh, but there's, we, and all of this, my stepmother's 80, my sister's like 52, I'm six. Like we felt that, when, and there's this goat, she's trying and it takes hours and hours and hours. And there's something that happened. And because there, her husband wasn't there and there was no man there. We all, it was, we almost held hands and levitated. I am not kidding. Cause it's a woman thing. And I don't see those women all the time. They're not lesbian. They're not, it's just my stepmom and my half sister, right? It was just what's happening. We're doing, and we're helping the goat and going, it's okay, honey, we got you in this. We're rocking and this whole thing's happening. But that is a woman thing. And why do you want to let that go? Women's bars aren't about needing to find someone to fuck. Men's bars will always exist because boys want to find someone to fuck, meaning that's not why they all go there or anything, but they'll always exist because they make their money on boys going back and going back and going back to meet somebody. Women, we meet somebody and we go, and let's create a home. And you know what I mean? And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that if you want to do that. But it's okay for us to have spaces. And if that's bars, great. If it's not, if it's festivals, great. It doesn't matter. But don't just go, oh, we don't need that anymore because we're accepted. Because that was not just about acceptance. It's okay to also honor that you're a woman and get have other women and kind of just be on, be out from under the patriarchy for 10 minutes or an hour or whatever. It's, it's a good thing. It's very positive. Anyone who's ever been to a women's festival knows and you can go with such an attitude women's festival this folk music so stupid after 24 hours you're like oh because there's no men there and something happens we get lifted up and it's different and you you're not you're not trying to fit in you do fit in you're cre you created the rules because they're your well, straight women for a while there um they would do these things too and they call them book clubs <laughs> to get the hell away from the men and have their own cocktails and and canapes and just eat shit food and dish the dirt and you know and, and you know and you know and and you know, women, you know, it, it's that bond that women create. I'm sure men, you know, do their own thing. You know, they to call it sports, um, but um, I do not. And so, you know, I like to sit and talk. You know, I like to get deep, you know, with my friends. And you can really have it with girlfriends. And, and you know, it's like, I don't know. I'm a phyllis. I mean, yes, I, I do a million hypotheticals. I'm a little philosophical. I'm a little out there. But you know what? It's that connection that I, I feel with people. And I think women can get to that level without feeling threatened. Actually, when we all get to that level, I think we rise to the occasion. And there's nothing better than to be in a circle of women that are supportive mm -hmm. and understanding. And I don't know if guys have that. I don't know. I don't, I'm never around guys. I, I really am not. Never have been, you know? But I know that it's this energy with women coming together that there's nothing like it. And I and look, and I, like I get this energy not only with lesbians, you know, I've got straight women friends. It's that same energy, you know. And I, it's, to I totally agree. But let me just throw this out there: we are all of the same age group. Could it be that we feel that way because of what we have experienced through our life? Maybe they haven't experienced that. If you if you look at a sports analogy, when I was- I knew she was gonna do this, go ahead. <laughs> you'll get this, you'll totally get this one though. When I was watching sports, there weren't female broadcasters, there oh. weren't female sideline reporters, there weren't anything. So they got gross comments, they got all kind of, you know what I mean? They got sort of just, it was the grossness that you would expect. The, now the kids now that are 18 that are 20 years old they have grown up their entire life with pam oliver on the sideline asking questions with all of these women that they know so to them it's not a weird thing and i totally agree with you yes there's something different that happens when women get together and when we're all together and we're, we're all with our like you guys like use the word tribe a lot when you get with your own tribe but it it could be that tribal nature isn't going to be as strong in the upcoming generations because they look at life differently i'm i'm just throwing that out there. i don't say that that's oh, you know what you jenny you make a good point need this space i'm still here should i be oh. hanging up
no, no, no. You can listen. Stay. I don't care. But Suzanne's getting very passionate. I'm cutting her off. Go ahead. Oh, Red. <laughs> I'm worried. I'm uh, no, I'm just saying, like, think about this right now. Do you think there's a talk show somewhere where there are five or six males on and they're going, well, we don't need this space anymore. Or we don't need. No, 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 no. I just promise you that one thing because it's never occurring to them. And yet women are willing to give it up immediately. Oh, well, we don't need it anymore. Oh, no, we can be this. We this. We're right away. We're willing to go. Okay, things are better now in sports, so it's okay. No, keep on and keep creating more and stay together. I'm just now what I'm saying. I'm just saying that we are looking at this through the glasses, on our uh, own such and such years glasses that we've lived this life. Mm -hmm. Had a fucking thumb on us by the white male rich people. Nothing's changed, Jenny. It's not. It, I mean, no. I'm, I'm sorry. Obviously, things have gotten changed. They're gotten changed. Oh my God! Excellent dog. Um, but. <laughs> What I'm saying is we don't, we never got to roll. We are still, we're, we're just, we're still in the middle of getting basically what men have. We're, we still don't make the same money. We still apologize when they don't. Uh, ask any HR person anywhere in the world and they're gonna tell you, um, women come in and go, maybe I should get a raise or I should have whatever. And men come in and go, hey, I've been here a year, why don't I get more? Boom, all over every company. All I'm saying is, we're not there yet where women are even equal. They're not. We got, and so we got this much in the last 20 years and we're already willing. Listen to you, Jenny. We're already willing to go. And maybe that's the that's all we're going to get. And we should. I did not say that. I'm just saying that it could be that that's what they feel. They're the ones saying, I'm not the one saying we don't need the gay bars. I hate the gay bars here. I'm just saying those kids that say we don't need the gay bars because maybe they don't feel the oppression we felt because they don't understand i mean they're I coming for, i mean when they were born or whatever into this you know you know our movement really has gone leaps and bounds from 1985 to now you know and that's not that long ago i mean i'm still breathing and not on like not in a wheelchair so it's not that long ago but we have done these leaps and bounds but these kids they don't know any of our history and i don't think nor do you know, and I, I think they don't care really about yeah. that. You see, with us, I think with our generation, because we were the groundbreakers mm -hmm. because AIDS, AIDS really brought the LGBT community really to light and focus. Mm -hmm. And okay. it gave us something to rally around to say, notice mm -hmm. us, we matter. And that's where our collective, men and women, because don't tell me, I mean, I heard stories back in the day, like a boy, a men's bar was a men's bar and not a woman was invited. And then when a, a lesbian, no man, but gay or not, was not welcome I in did. the bar. So in our own community, there was dissension yeah. and yeah. discrimination. But still happening. I, you can go to, I just was in a bar uh, called The Vault in Provincetown, I wanna say not even four years ago. And I went in with two women and it's a boy fuck bar in the back, but kind of a little bunny bar. And as soon as we walked in, they went, oh no. And they were like, do you have to be in here? And the one guy was like, and it's only because he knew me and I performed in town was I allowed to stay there with three girls. Listen, if you think, I, and I don't feel like, and I get Jenny, you're saying maybe they won't feel it, but they will. As soon as the women start to try to do one thing that isn't already planned out for them or, or game for them by the women from the sixties or seventies or whatever, and they're gonna go, well, what, wait, I'm still only making 89 cents when the guy's making a buck? What the fuck? Like, it, it's going to, and that's still true. And until that equality, whatever happens, we, it's okay for us to fight for it and say we deserve space and stay women positive and all the things that sound really goofy and old school from the seventies, but we didn't get the things we, we didn't get all the things we want yet. Look, I'm thinking, I mean, I think at least in LA, I think one of the, the last female lesbian trailblazers is Robin. Robin Tyler. Robin Tyler, I mean, Ivy Bettini, she just passed away, you mm -hmm. know? So, I mean, so I think Robin is the last, I think of that generation that was very in your face vocal, mm -hmm. you know? And, and you know, when you think of the LGBT community at the time, you know, I know you had Harvey Milk in New York, but in LA, it literally were the women that mm -hmm. brought it to the forefront. Mm -hmm. Those women were the ones so you know and and you know 
New York during the AIDS crisis because the boys were dying and the girls weren't honest to God. And this is politically incorrect to say the girls weren't getting it and they weren't dying and they didn't know why. We didn't know why. We didn't know why, but we knew we had to take care of our brothers and we did. Will they take care of us if we all get something? We don't know yet. We just, it's the fight is not over because and we gained, we gained this. We can't go, okay. Hey, Suzanne, it goes beyond gay straight. We have a pandemic right now. Who the fuck's taking care of each other? And that's on the basic bottom line because this has become the me, 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 me fucking generation. You know, it's like where, you know, and I, I it's like, you know, it's just the me generation. Well, wait, for themselves. You remember in the seven, I think of the seventies or the eighties was the me generation. They would say it on Saturday Night Live. So it, I don't remember which one it is, but all I'm saying is young people go through all of us in our 40s, 50s, 60s going, oh, they're so selfish. They're so selfish. That happens every time too. All of a sudden, a lot of these women are going to want a place to perform, a place to hang or whatever. And we, it's okay for us to continue to support that. What, it, and yes, they are right now. They're going, no, it's about you no know, gender and whatever. That's okay. But they're also all of a sudden going to say, hey, there's no gender. And yet I'm getting paid less. That seems weird. <laughs> So there, it's going to come up again. The women who are 18 now are going to get to be 25 out of college going, why the fuck can't I get? I don't understand. I, I've been working here, whatever. How do, you, how do you get the promotion? How do you get the raise? Well, you know what? One would hope. I just hope. I, I mean, you know, we can be cynics, uh, which I try not to be as I get older. I'm very cynical. I try not to be sarcastic, as sarcastic and cynical. It doesn't work. But I mean, one would hope that, you know, we are going to move in that direction that, you know, we won't be having, you know, I can only have hope. You know, I think a lot of stuff that has got me through in life is having hope, you know, is saying, you know, it'll be better, not maybe, or can it be, it's I'm so sorry. Be better. Yeah. And <clears throat> it's about, you know, having a voice like we all do in whatever, whatever aspect we are. And even if you're not on a podcast or not on a TV show or not wherever, it's still, you know, just because you don't have this voice like we all do on this podcast, and it's it's not about having it's not about having a loud voice or having the voice. It's about having a collective voice yes. at whatever level that you're at. We all make a difference. We all will make a difference. So you know, whether we're gay, whether we're lesbian, whether we're transgendered, whether we're black, Asian. We all have a voice and it's having hope to know that if we keep, keep on fighting the good fight and we fight it in all different ways and use whatever forum that we can, you know, even at the bottomless level, you know, it starts even in a bar with a small group of people having a discussion that is just as important as Jenny or Suzanne or myself getting on a, a stage at Gay Pride or a festival saying it or being on television. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, please do never, never, never squelch your voice. Mm -hmm. um, you want change? You've got to, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to speak out. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I've, I've been the activist. I, I've marched with ACT UP. I, I you know, I, I pretty much, my life is parallel to Suzanne's um, mm -hmm. in a way, but you know, it doesn't necessarily mean the loudest voice matters. Sometimes it's the softest voice that gets the ear mm -hmm. and that gets change in motion. So I'm going to wrap up the show right now, but I just want to thank you, Suzanne, for your passion. I feel like I got way out of hand. I'm sorry. Oh, we've gone on a really long, do you realize it's almost two hours? Of the talk? My friends are out there going, uh, we allowed to come back in. What's going on? <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you for being a trailblazer. Thank you for doing all that you do and continue to do and not being quiet, um, <laughs> being as authentic and funny and real. So you know, you are 60, but who cares? It's, it's, it doesn't matter. It's just an age and you are continuing. You look fabulous. You look hot and sexy and you're married. So you're off the market, but, um, as she rolls her eyes, big eye roll, but I just want to thank you on behalf of this panel of myself, um, for being who you are and doing what you have done and continue to do. It's an honor really to know you. And it's an honor to have you on my show. Yes. Um, so thank you, kind of Jersey girl. Um, mm -hmm. remember the bagel place next to Hagen Dazs? Yeah, the uh, we used to trade all the time Hagen Dazs for bagel, Hagen Dazs for every morning, and I got the sesame. Thing. I, I, know. I got, I got it. 
we got when you when you get you would live in LA, right? Yeah. Well, we have to all get together and talk Jersey talk. Um, oh but I want to say thank you. So this is your time right now to sort of promote what you're doing, um, what where you have what your what your handle is on Instagram, your Facebook page, and if you have a show or anything going on. This is your chance now. Jenny, Jenny and I have a show in Ventura next Thursday. Um, it's live. You'd be insane if you didn't come to that because we neither of us have really been live for a while. And for all the, uh, j just remember that no matter what you're doing, if you're not the the wealthy white man, um, you are being oppressed, and it's okay. But meaning like we can, but don't so don't turn to other women and worry about them. They are your friends. Don't turn to other people of different colors, whatever. They're your friends too. It's the people in charge. Let's topple them and stay together. And don't you have a show? Because I heard you had one of my best friends on your show too, Sharon Glass. <laughs> um, yes, I also have a, a, a show on Women on the Net, a, a talk show. Oh my God, I have all kinds. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not good at promotion. That's good. <laughs> you, know, you guys know how to do, everybody knows how to do Google, Suzanne West, whatever shit will come up. That's her, that's her publicist, and and I am a publicist, and that's great. That's why you need to hire. That's why you hire people like me because you know, just look me up on Google. The shit's all up there. Um, but thank you so much, Roxanne. Tell us a little bit about you, love. What's going on with you? Where you know, I just want to say you know, I made all these wristbands. I can't. I don't know if you could see it for my team. Uh, faith, uh, courage, strength hope and it has these beautiful things from martin luther king mark twain uh gandhi and it just that's just what i've been up to it's just really getting into um taking care of me taking care of everyone around me uh teaching people how to believe in themselves and just having the strength to live a life that they're passionate about COVID really got people to realize that they were not living a life full of passion. And Perfect. I have hired people on my team that I never thought I would hire, like engineers are oh, coming into awesome. sales so they could be passionate about something. And it's amazing. So that's so what Roxanne, I where can people find you? On Roxanne Rosen on Facebook. Thank you. Cheryl Murphy, what do you yeah. have going on? What's, what are you promoting? What are we doing? Yeah. Guys, you can always find out my upcoming events on my website, mediumcheryl.com. Also on Facebook, Instagram, Medium Cheryl. Um, I do have some events coming up. So, and I'm always doing my readings on Zoom and uh, over the phone still. I'm still kind of not out in public demonstrations yet, but I will be soon. And Jenny McNulty. Jenny. Find me at a large Jenny. No, I'm kidding. Uh so, so we'll play on the, I am so darn funny. Uh, I am a Jenny McNulty fan. I'm uh, taking a brief hiatus to rebrand my show. It was the in-house comedy chat. It is now going to be chat and go with Jenny McNulty because I'm trying to get people up and going and we're not going to be stuck very much longer. So I'm going to spend the next week or so rebranding that and starting that live. I've got a show with Suzanne next week. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, helping one of the segment producers on Suzanne's show, which is Saturday, May 15th on Women on the Net. Uh, there, so you can look that up at womenonthenet.net to find Suzanne's show. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you, Tony. I think you're still there working the board. Um, everyone, thank you again. Um, my message, I said it earlier, is hope. Let's all have hope. Um, I care about all of you. I appreciate you supporting us and everyone on my panel. QTE Brat on Instagram, Between the Sheets podcast. The show will be up, uh, that's on Facebook. The show will be up everywhere, like on all the iTunes and Google Play and all that other stuff. Um, also, the, the video version will be on YouTube, Between the Sheets with Gay and Bruno. Um, and to see you in two weeks. We're on the first and third Friday of every month. And on May 7th, which I think is a Friday, we will be having a clairvoyant on. And um, she's a woman in our community, and her name is Amadeus. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Amadeus yeah. will be coming. Your sister recommended her, Jenny. To be ah, honest. she's awesome. She's yeah. she's a adorable. I tried to get your sister and Sonia on the show, but because they just got that deal, they just won that award. They're not ready yet. So, <laughs> so I'll let the I'll, I'll let the you know the the princesses just glide on that and when they're ready <laughs> sister also is a wonderful artist but right now we have amadeus on 
Um, I she's on Facebook as Amadeus Amadeus. I, I don't know really much about her. Oh. We're having a call when she gets back um, to sort of me do a pre-interview. So I just want to say thank you, everybody. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Roxanne. Thank you, Cheryl. And thank you, Jenny. And thank you, guys. Um, as always, be safe, be well, and namaste. Have a good night. Namaste. Namaste. Bye, everyone.